Abandon all prejudices, all ye who enter here. Park your paradigms, perk up your ears, and open your mind as we now shine the laser light of reason on the topic of overpopulation. Hello, I'm David Bolden, and welcome to part three of this series of podcasts dedicated to helping people think more clearly, make sounder judgments, and above all, to unceasingly question instead of naively accepting what others want us to believe. For this is the path of Socrates. First, we're going to start with a little trivia, just for fun. Now, most of you will know probably when World War I was. It was between 1914 and 1918, a horrible conflagration that killed tens of millions of people. And you might also know that that Spanish flu, that worldwide pandemic that started in 1918, went to about 1920 or 21. Well, that killed even more people in World War I. It killed about 50 million people in the world. That's almost 1% of the world's population. And if you think that was bad, well, let's go a little bit in the future. In the 1930s, Japan attacks China, and that was really when World War II began, at least in the Orient. Of course, in Europe, it began 1939 for America, 1941. We had World War, War, uh, World War II that killed so many other people, tens of millions of people. Now, my question is this. Between 1913 and 1945, remember, uh, World War I began 1914, right? So in this period of 32 years, 1930, 13, 14 to 1945, we had World War I, we had the great world pandemic, you think COVID's bad, boy, you ought to read about what it was like back then, and World War II, the worst war in all of human history. So the trivia question is, by what percentage do you think the world's population sank in that time? How many fewer people do you think there were in 1945 when compared to 1913, 1914? Well, you'll probably say, well, I don't know, maybe 2% less, 5%, mid 10%. No, not true. In fact, the world's population increased by about 600 million people, despite World War I, despite the so-called Spanish flu, that great pandemic, much, much worse than COVID. And despite World War II, still the population of the world increased. So after World War II, there are approximately 2.4 billion people in the world. Well, that's a lot of people. 2.4 billion. How many people are in the world now? Well, 1951, it had grown to about 2.6 billion. So let's take that number. 1951, 2.6 billion. Here we are, 2021, 70 years later. How much has the population grown? It's multiplied by over three times. We're now at 7.9 billion in only a little less than one lifetime, 70 years. The population has more than tripled. Now, if you have an eternal mindset of, well, the more the merrier, think again and again and again, and above all, think a bit more deeply. So many of the world's problems are due to one factor. No Bernie Sanders and others of your mindset, it's not global warming, oh, I'm sorry, climate change. They changed the term from global warming to climate change when they saw things weren't maybe getting that warm. Let's call it climate change, okay. I'm not saying that's not a problem, never said it. I never said it doesn't exist. But anyone who thinks as Bernie Sanders did in 2016 when asked in a a presidential primary debate what he thinks the greatest problem for humanity is and for the United States, he said global warming. I thought this man must be a fool because global warming, believe me, is not the greatest problem. Climate change is not the greatest problem and there will come a day when people will be praying for bad temperature in some places, extreme temperatures, tsunamis, just to kill off some of the surplus people. This sounds extremely harsh, and no, I'm not saying I would pray for that. But listen to what I have to say. Totally based on the numbers, 
totally based on reason. I think you'll have to agree to that. The world's population tripling in 70 years is an alarming trend. Now, it is true that the growth rate is going down. If I take some numbers here from a table I have the internet, 1951, the growth rate was 1.88% greater every year, right? Well, 1.81 in 1952, 1957, 1.8%. 1 it was growing in, in the 60s, got up to 2%. Now it's down to 1.05% uh, change going upwards, right? Well, we could maybe assume that it's going to go down to 1% and then 0.9%. In any case, uh, if you look at the predictions by experts in this field, some say, well, it's going to level off about 11 or 12 billion. But consider that. And these are the optimists. These are the optimists that say in so and so many years, the world's population is going to level off. Let's, let's take the more optimistic number of 11 billion. Now we have just about what says here 2020, 7.794, no, 7 billion. Excuse me, 7 uh, billion, 794 million, 798,739. Don't ask me how they counted those people that exactly. I think that's, <laughs> that's probably just, just an estimate. Uh, let's say 7.79 billion in 2020. Now it's up to 8 billion, we could say. Some say it's 7.8 billion. Now you can't judge these things exactly, very obviously. But let's say it goes up to 11 billion only, and that's what optimists say. What does this mean? This means three billion more people in the world. And let's say that's also in 70 years. In one lifetime, three billion more people. That's more than twice the population of China, extra people. Compared to the United States, that's like nine times more the population of the United States. Now we have problems based on overpopulation. Look at Africa, countries like Nigeria, countries like India, India's population is rapidly catching up to China's population. What problems does this cause? A whole myriad of problems. Pollution, obviously. All those plastic bags in the ocean they talk about, well, the, the great majority come from India and China, uh, according to what I've read. Uh, and there'll be more pollution as well, and not just from those countries. There'll be inevitably more pollution all over the place because there's so many more people. Land prices will go up of course, obviously. Uh, there would be more wars. If a disease breaks out, it could spread much more quickly because people are, are more densely populating the cities and the towns. At some point, we'll get to the point where there are just so many people will have to do something about it. Now, let's think about this. As I said, the optimists say, well, it might just level off at about 11 billion. The pessimists don't say that. The pessimists say, what happens if in the next 70 years, uh, the population just keeps going up? Now you could say, well, it's probably not going to triple again, because if it does, we're at 24 billion people in one lifetime. In 70 years, we're at 24 billion people. You think about that number. Of course, nobody can really imagine that number. But think now that we're at 8 billion, and think of how many people are around. Think of three times that in one lifetime. Now, you might say, well, since the change is going up more slowly, but consider this. There are more and more old people around because of advances in medical science, right? Even if the population stayed the same as we have now, say roughly 8 billion, let's imagine by some miracle, because it would take practically a miracle, the population levels off at 8 billion people. Even that is a scenario for disaster in the future. Why? One word, mechanization. And that's only one reason. Mechanization, robots. You ever have a conversation? I had one with a friend about a year ago, just talking about possible future with robots. I mean, they're more and more omnipresent. I saw some documentary on TV about uh, Japan and their love robots. These are things they look, if you see from a little distance, it looks just like beautiful women, right? I mean, they're really buxom and, and beautiful, but they're dolls. They're basically love dolls. Now, maybe it's just me, but I could, you know, I'm a, a normal guy. 
and I've always been attracted to women, but I can't see doing anything with a, a love doll. I mean, you know, give me some soul, please. <laughs> it's a big hunk of plastic and machinery inside or whatever. But to each his own. To each his own. I'm not condemning that. Okay. To each his own. It's neat. At least you're not exploiting any, any real person, right? But these love dolls, they could, they could talk, they could move, they could say suggestive things to you, of course. I think you program them to speak more dirtily or more cleanly or more properly or whatever. This is one example of a type of robot that uh, maybe not so surprisingly, uh, robot love doll technology is more advanced in Japan than any place else. Uh, says something about Japanese culture, I think, but I won't go into that now. That's a subject for another podcast. I've lived in Japan for 12 years now. I know something about it. Okay. Say the world's population levels off at 8 billion. But then they come up with more and more ways basically to do it away with workers. Why? Ah, here we see how things get interconnected. You see, what many people don't do is they examine one phenomenon, for example, overpopulation. And then another day they examine another population, for example, socialist societies. That is socialist uh, nets, right? The social net. And then another day they talk about this. No, no, all these things are connected. And you have to see it all from above, from 40,000 feet, if not more. I've always had the sort of talent to do just that. I can go back and forth between the individual tree and the entire forest, and then seeing the forest from above as well. And this is a trait, uh, 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 let's see, a, a talent that anyone can practice. And we're going to do that now. Okay, 8 billion people. And we're assuming that the population does not grow, which it is. Remember, the optimists say it'll level off at 11 billion, 3 billion more. Pessimists say, no, it's not going to level off. It's going to keep going up and up and up at a much faster rate. But let's just assume the 8 billion of now, right? A friend of mine in Spain told me that uh, recently thousands of bank workers lost their jobs. Why? Well, because of machines. In other words, they had more automatic tellers or whatever, and they didn't need as many people. Well, why are they doing that? because it's cheaper for them. Why is it so much cheaper for them? Because of the social network, for example, in Spain, if you hire somebody and you have them working there for more than three years, it's impossible to fire them unless you pay them like $10,000 payoff. In other words, you have somebody who's working there for four years and you see he's getting lazier and lazier. He's not doing his job. You can't just say, I'm sorry, you're fired. You have to say, I'm sorry, you're fired, but here's your 10,000 euros, which is more than, it's like $11,000. That's what you have to do. And so what do the companies do there? They hire somebody for two years and 11 months and then they fire them because they don't want to get into that social thing of not being able to fire them without paying them a big sum, sum of money. And besides that, salaries are always going up. But if you have some kind of nice robot or machine, it doesn't have a salary. It works for free. Sure, you have to repair it. But if you keep it in running order and you keep the, the chips in it functioning well and put in oil here and there, I don't know how they do the grease up the parts of some kind of uh, uh, robot in a bank. I don't know. I'm no expert in such things. Don't want to be either. But it's much cheaper than having a worker there. For example, if the worker is female and then she gets pregnant, well, then she gets a lot of time off, maybe a few months off, and you have to keep paying her. Well, guess what? These robots don't get pregnant. So why should you hire a woman? And if it's a man, well, maybe the man smokes a lot. Well, he can get sick, and then you have to, uh, we have to pay for his health care anyway if he's working for you. Guess what? Robots don't need hospitals. If your robot breaks down, has the robotic equivalent of a heart attack, what do you do? You scrap the thing. You throw it in the garbage, and you buy another robot. And by that time, robots will be cheaper because the more of them around, the more there are, the cheaper they get. We all know that, right? So it's much better to mechanize. You know, I saw something about a month ago, and at first I thought it was a joke, but yet I don't think it was a joke. It was, well, you know, drones are popular these days. We can use drones for anything. Obama once, I don't know whether he's joking or bragging, but he said to the pe people around him, uh, I can kill people very effectively with my drones. I assume it was a like, kind of dark humor, <laughs> but it's true. You know, American presidents have killed people with drones. In the case of Obama, he killed an American citizen that was linked to terrorists and instead of, you know, capturing him for a trial. Even as an American citizen, he just, you know, blew him up. Uh, if I'm, I'm wrong on that, somebody correct me, but I remember reading the story years ago. I'm not going to go back and research everything. These talks of mine are informal and they're designed to make you think. 
So if they make you think in a direction that you might want to contradict me and point out some error I make, please do that. At least you're thinking, right? I'm more a thinking person, but believe me, I have emotion as well. And there's a big place for emotion in life. But now we're back to the 8 billion people in the world. And the population is not going to grow. We're imagining because it is growing. It's growing every day. Levels off at 8 billion, but what happens? Because of the social systems, because of salaries that increase, because of you know, medical care price increase, etc. More and more companies think, well, hey, if we can automate it, great. I remember talking to my cousin oh, 15, about 20 years ago. He works at the Baltimore waterfront. He wasn't the only one in my family. My father worked at the waterfront all his life. His father, my grandfather did. Uh, my cousin did. His father did. An uncle of my father's did. There's so many men in the Bolton family worked in the Baltimore waterfront. Even I considered it one time when I was young. But I thought, no, I'd rather live in another country. Whatever. I remember talking to my cousin about 20 years ago, and he was telling me the Baltimore waterfront, that was about the year 2000. He said, it's really going downhill in one sense. There aren't as many people working there. I said, well, why not? He said, mechanization. When my father worked there back in the 50s, 60s, he died in 78. There's still a good number of people there. But then mechanization, machines to do this, to move things around, do this and that. They don't need as many people. And this was 20 years ago. Now, what I saw about a month or so ago, I said, a drone is a very special drone. I could hardly believe it. If somebody has seen this and can show me, oh, no, it was really just an elaborate joke made to look real, fine. I'd be happy about it. But even if this wasn't real, sooner or later they're going to have this. But it looked real, like I said. This was some kind of short film, advertising film for a company that makes drones that fly around and pick fruit. You think about this. It was like a normal sized drone. I don't know how big the thing was, 15, 20 inches. I, I can't remember exactly. And this had sensors on it. This drone could sense, ah, there's oranges there. This one's ripe, this one's ripe, this one isn't ripe yet. So it would go over and I guess stretch out some little robotic arms, pluck the fruit, I don't know exactly how it did, and then drop in the basket. I mean, this really sounds funny, doesn't it? <laughs> Was this some kind of elaborate joke? I don't know. Look it up yourself. I don't feel looking at it. Like I said, it's an example. Because if it's not there yet, it will be in the future. But what was especially unbelievable to me was the advertising. Advertising always tries to make things look better, right? Buy our product. Let's say Coca-Cola. Buy it. You'll feel better. It makes you happy. Well, it has so much sugar in it that your teeth might start rotting and you could get diabetes or drink too much. It doesn't mention those things. Okay, I've always liked Coke and I admit it, but everything in moderation. Everything in moderation, right? To get back to our little flying fruit picking drone, in the little video they made advertising this, because obviously they want to sell this product, right? Whether they had finished doing this model or whether it was on their work table and they were going to have it within a year, I don't remember that. But as I said, someday they're going to have this anyway. Let's assume that's already there. They actually said, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact words, but more or less they said this. You might think this would be bad for all the migrant workers who pick fruit, but no, not at all. Because drones are picking the fruit, these people will now be free to go to the cities and get better jobs. I kid you not, that's what they said. Now it would seem to me anybody who's able to think at all and knows anything about anything <laughs> would immediately think, wait a minute, if these migrant workers could get better jobs in the cities, they'd be there right now. They wouldn't be out in the hot sun picking fruit all day, would they now? Let's put the fact aside that many of these migrant workers are illegals being hired, working for less than minimum wage, and they couldn't go to some company in the city to get a job, even if they could speak English, even if they could speak Spanish well, because let me tell you, I lived in Mexico for a while, and uh, that was, this was 1976. I was appalled that even Spaniards who were considered not low class couldn't write their language well. There's spelling mistakes all over. You think that our high school graduates are dumb as far as their language level is concerned. My God, Mexico was much worse, let me tell you. But that the migrant workers, and these are the ones that didn't even finish high school, and the ones that are so poor, and I understand them well why they want to get across that border to go north. They go up there, and some are thankful to get a job picking fruit. But that when they're out of work, thanks to these wonderful little drones, that they can then just walk to the next city and go into some office to get an office job, I mean... This is fantasy, and this is malicious propaganda because this ain't going to happen. Let's face it. No, we're going to have millions more people out of work.
thanks to the little wonder drones that are picking our fruit for us. And that's just one area. There's a supermarket here where I live around Tokyo. And uh, it's a very popular supermarket. I don't like it too much. It's usually too filled with people. But now I go in, I get confused. Not only because the signs in Japanese, I don't read Japanese, and my spoken Japanese is going downhill because I just stopped learning it. I, it was just too much for me. I should have come here when I was 20, then I would have learned it well. But anyway, I go in there, and I wait 15 minutes in line, but then somebody, some other employee there says, oh no, this is a line you have to, you have to pay with a machine. And I know how to work the machine, so I have to go wait in another line for 15 minutes. Anyway, the tendency is to do everything in supermarkets, just, you know, you hold your food up to some kind of thing that registers it, and then you put the money in. Uh, of course, in America, that wouldn't work so well because half the people would you know, grab the food and run out and wouldn't even pay. In Japan, people don't do that. That's another talk I'll give, uh, more on the ethical level. How could it be the Japanese commit so few crimes? Not that none are criminals. Of course, there's some criminals here. But comparatively, compared to, to Germany, where I lived for many years, compared to Spain, even more so in Spain, compared to the U.S., the Japanese are like model citizens. Uh, why aren't we? Why aren't Americans model citizens? Why aren't Spanish model citizens? That'll be a, 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 I'll add that to my list of things to talk about. It might interest you. It certainly interests me. But if we're going towards a world where there's machines for everything, oh, and, and by the way, before you know it, they're going to be machines looking like people, just like those love dolls. They look like real girls, and they get up too close. And I don't want to get up too close. Don't get me wrong. But we're going to have in a future, and it might not be that far away, because progression, progress is now a geometric progression, right? And has been for a long time. That you go into a store and you, and you hear, hello, how are you? How may I help you? And look up and it's a robot. But it looks really human. I'm telling you here in Japan, I get the feeling they already have them here. Because when you go into any store in Japan, they say, irashaimase, 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 which means something like welcome. You never hear, hello, how are you today? Even if you go into that store 100 times or 200 times, you don't hear, oh, hi, how are you? I haven't seen you in a, a week or so. You never hear any of that kind of small talk. That's pleasant, let's face it. No, it's, irashaimase, irashaimase. You can walk down an aisle and some stock boy is there putting more spaghetti into the rectory. He's not even looking at you. But as soon as you pass me, he says, irashaimase, irashaimase. I think half these people are robots here. Of course, I'm kidding. They really aren't. They're really people. They're just Japanese people. If you've ever wondered, because you've seen mangas or anything from Japan, you ever wondered why there's so many robots in Japanese culture? Any of you older folks remember Gigantor? It was a Japanese cartoon with this lousy animation. You know, I liked, uh, I liked cartoons like, I don't know, Johnny Quest, where they actually moved, you know, this is why I like The Simpsons, because they move more or less flowingly. And I don't like South Parks because they move like in a jerky way back and it just seems so stupid and primitive. Uh, <laughs> I'm giving my prejudices on my taste in cartoons, but as I said in my first talk, it's like a stream of consciousness thing. And these things are connected. But did you ever wonder why the Japanese and robots is such a big thing? I sometimes think that's the ideal of the Japanese. They have a saying in Japanese, and it's uh, translated, the nail that sticks up the highest is the first one to get hammered. Meaning, don't stand out. Don't stand out in the crowd. Don't be original. Don't be like other people. Try to be like everybody else, because if you stand out, you're going to get hammered. I can't tell you how much I abhor the saying and the philosophy behind it. I can't tell you how much I hate that. Because I am an individual. And you, my dear listener, most probably are also, or you wouldn't have listened to me up to this point. <laughs> but any people that thinks it's the ideal to just not stand out. Now, I understand it historically. The Japanese did not inherit uh, British freedoms and democracy parliamentary system and all that. No, no. Not all that long ago, you had the samurai walking around, and if you just looked at the guy the wrong way, he'd take out his sword and cut you in half. The Japanese peasant was not like the British peasant. Oh, the British peasant had it bad enough, but that's nothing but the Japanese peasant. There are stories even in the, in the 20th century. 
that maybe, well, in China, for instance, things, things the Japanese did. The, some of the soldiers, to practice their swordsmanship, they would literally just cut people in half to see if they can do it. And I don't mean across their midsection, you know, top half, bottom half. I mean they would come up behind you or in front of you and cut you at the top of the head and see if they can split your body from the top of the head down to the crotch. And they do it just either for fun or to practice their swordsmanship. The samurai were, were, were tough characters, let me tell you. And if some peasant dared to even look at them the wrong way, they were history. So I can understand their culture like that, even though Japan's had democracy for decades now. I can understand that people traditionally have learned, don't stand out, don't make waves, don't be a revolutionary. When there was the big earthquake in Japan, 2011, I'll get into that some other time, there were a few thousand people protesting the fact that they had built that, that, that uh, nuclear power plant near a fault line. But let me tell you, there are more people protesting nuclear power plants in Germany at that time, even though in Germany nothing had happened, just because they saw the news about Japan. There are many more people protesting nuclear power in Germany than in Japan, even though it happened here. Why? Because Japanese generally don't demonstrate. You don't want to stand out. You don't want to protest. I could tell you stories, maybe in the future I will, things that, that you wouldn't believe. Uh, here, Japan. And I do love Japan in many ways. Japanese people are nice, friendly, polite. They don't they hardly ever commit crimes. Most people don't, they would never think of shoplifting. Remember, what, what was it? Hurricane Katrina in, in uh, Louisiana, New Orleans, and the whole area there. How people were taking advantage to rob every shop blind. And there were even people taking pot shots at, at, at workers, firefighters, and such people. What kind of scum live in America anyway? I can only say. You can't even think of that in Japan. It turned out the big earthquake. Yes, people had to run out of department stores, but people weren't picking up, the, oh, I'll steal this, I'll steal that. And let me tell you, they, they do that in other countries. And you Americans know how they do that. It is absolutely disgusting. And I'm sure many of you agree with me. Some of you might think, oh, why? If you know we can run out and the cops aren't going to see it. I don't understand that attitude. I'm sorry. But getting back to these 8 billion people. You know, you ever think, one time I thought a script for a movie. I won't go into that now. Maybe I shouldn't do that. But let's put it this way. Suppose 100 million people, 500 million people just dropped dead. But suppose it were an alien plan to kill all the bad people in the world, all the murderers and all the criminals, whether in, in politics or, or in the streets, whatever. Would it really be so bad? <laughs> I say that jokingly. I say that jokingly. But it connects to how I'm going to continue here. We're back to our 8 billion people, and since we're being optimistic for a little while, we're going to assume the population does not grow. But we have this plague onslaught of higher technology, mechanization, and robots. How are people going to work? Who's going to be cleaning the streets when you have robots cleaning the streets? Who's going to be working in banks when practically everything is mechanized? Who's only working in supermarkets when you have machines to do that? Who's only working anywhere? In other words, even if the population is 8 billion, you're going to have more and more people that are useless. I don't mean ethically speaking. I don't mean spiritually speaking useless. I mean in the minds of those who control the system, the great majority of people are going to be useless. So... They're useless for them, but how are they going to support them? Are they going to let them die of starvation? If those people start dying of starvation, they're going to rise up and just it's going to be revolutions, downfalls of governments all over the place. So those in power cannot allow that, and they're not going to want to allow that because they're going to be killed. So let me ask you this. This is a very delicate topic, and please think along with me here. We're now going to take a leap into the future. And we're not going to be quite so optimistic. We're not going to assume that the population is going to level of 8 billion because it's not. Even the optimists say 11 billion. Let's assume we're 100 years in the future. And you, my friend, and I, we are the leaders of the world. I don't know how it happened, but that one world government came about. God forbid that that ever happened. I'm going to get into that in another talk. Uh, let's all hope, and if you're a praying person, uh, I'm not so much. But if you are, then pray that that doesn't happen. But let's assume there's one world government and things have gone more or less all right. Let's assume things are democratic as well. But that you, whoever you may be listening to me now, and I, we're the world leaders. And we're good people. 
you know, I'm no saint, but I consider myself a good person. And you probably do too. Okay, we're the world leaders. I don't know, aliens came and gave us all the power. I don't know how we got there. Because we're not scrupulous, we're not bad, we're not anything, and we're not maybe especially ambitious. But for some reason, you and I, my friend, are the world leaders. But we live in a world that now has, say, 20 billion people. Practically all those people are unemployed somehow. Because let's face it, not everybody has the mind to do advanced computer programming for the newest robots that are coming out in other years. Let's face it, many people cannot do that. I remember George W. Bush when, uh, oh, what was that? Uh, let me think. Oh, yes, he, something happened. Oh, yes, when so many factories are going to China. He was saying, well, a lot of factory workers, all they have to do, we'll, give them some, we'll lend them some money that they can go take higher education, college courses to learn programming. I thought, what a fool this guy is. I don't know about your experiences. I lived in Baltimore until I was uh, almost 14. I lived in Hanover, PA, small town with several big factories. And I knew some people, some fine people. They did not want to go to college. Their parents maybe worked in local factories, maybe the Hanover Shoes or their Hanover Canning Company, whatever. There are a few big factories there that hired many people. And that's fine. They wouldn't work in factories. I think they were unionized, so they would get pay raise every year. And that's what they wanted to do. But these were not the people that were the typical nerds, intellectuals that wanted to study all the time. They were happy working in the factories. They worked their way up, you know, start out in the lowest level, then become a foreman, then maybe work their way up. And that's fine. We need people like that. But of course, when so many factories go to China, these people aren't employed. But to think that somebody that might already be 40, 45, 50, that hasn't studied since they were in high school, and that never was so inclined to study a whole lot, that at that age, when they're in their 40s, that they could, in some way, start taking college courses for computer programming, and then go out in the market and compete with these young whiz kids that are only maybe 18 years old, 20, 22, just out of college. And they've been programming since they were six years old. To think that is either a, a terrible lie, if you say it, as George W. Bush did, or he's a total fool. How can you think that? No, these people are going to be unemployed. These people are going to have to go work in Walmart and get less pay. Uh, these people are going to go work at McDonald's or whatever. Or some of them will come up with their own ideas for business and more power to them. But to think that all these thousands, thousands of people with lost factory jobs are, when they're older, going to go back to college, become brilliant computer programmers. That's a lie, let's face it. So what do you and I do, my friends? We're in the year 2121, 100 years in the future. And we have control of the world, but we see the population has grown to 20 or 25 billion. The great majority of people have no job at all. And, but they do have time because we have to somehow feed them. So somehow we're feeding them. What, or what are we feeding them? You ever see the movie Soil and Green? I won't spoil the ending for you. If you haven't seen the movie Soil and Green with Charlton Heston and Edward G. Robinson, the latter being one of the best actors in Hollywood, in my opinion, long dead. Look at that movie. I'm not saying that's exactly what's going to happen. But we're going to come up with something. First of all, how can these people be fed? Most would be dying of starvation, let's face it. There'll be wars going on. And we're going to come to the conclusion, my God, there are too many people. We have to start killing them off. And keep in mind, as I said before, I consider myself a good person. I think you consider a good person. But look at Australia. I think it was about 15 years ago. In Australia, the following happened. I remember seeing it somewhere in the news. Now, I don't think Australians hate kangaroos. The kangaroo and the koala, well, they're the two... <laughs> Symbols of Australia, aren't they now? By the way, if you like koalas, go to Amazon.com, type in Koala Land and David Bolton. Put David Bolton in quotes and you'll find my book, The Great Koala Novel. It's in five parts, first volume free. If you like koalas, I have to put in a little publicity here somehow. This, of all the books I've written, these books really are just not selling. It's not about making money so much now. It's about people reading my books. So if you like koalas, look up Koala Land. Anyway, I just said that because I mentioned Australia. Thought I'd get in a plug there. So, <laughs> anyway, I don't think Australians hate koalas. I don't think they hate kangaroos. But about 15 years ago, there was a plague of kangaroos. What was happening? They were multiplying too quickly. So the kangaroos, I guess, were getting into the farmer's fields and eating up the crops. I don't know what they were doing. The kangaroos, there are just too many of them. So what did the government do? I think they extended the hunting season. They tried to encourage people to go kangaroo hunting. Now, the people in the government didn't think, oh, we hate these kangaroos. We have to kill these damn kangaroos. No, they don't hate kangaroos. But they were thinking logically, rationally. There's so many kangaroos around. It can't go on like this. 
It's the same philosophy connected to hunting we have in the United States and Europe. The animal populations tend to increase, but then it gets to the point where if there are too many of them, many more are going to starve because there's not enough resources, not enough food for these animals. So some have to be killed off. Let me tell you, my friend, even you and I, and you'll see in a minute why I'm approaching it through this futuristic scenario in a hundred years, you and I being the leaders, even you and I, if we are the leaders of the world in a hundred years and the population has reached the stage where there are more and more crises, more things are just so terrible, even being the good people that we are, we're going to have to come to the conclusion, two possibilities. We have to force sterilize people. And if it's any semblance of democracy, you can't do that because people are going to rise up, right? Or we have to start killing people off. Not because we hate people. Not because we hate people, but because there's no other way. Just like the Australian government, they don't hate kangaroos, but they knew we had to kill off kangaroos. Now you might say, well, but things won't get that bad. Yeah, but suppose they do. Even if it gets up to 11 billion, even if it stays at 8 billion, what about in 100 years when robots do most of the task and most of these 8 billion are unemployed, they have nothing to do, they're living from the state, but the state, where's the state going to get the money if there are not enough people working paying taxes? How do you solve this problem? What do you do? I see no solution there, at least no easy solution. And the truth is, I don't even see an ethical solution here. I could say, well, people be convinced to not have as many children. Well, okay, the, the yearly change, always going upwards, of course, it, it is going up more slowly, but, you know, the optimists say we'll get to 11, 12 billion, and then with many more robots, and then with people living longer, what are we going to do? Well, what we could do, we could start not for sterilizing, sterilizing people exactly. Why not a lottery system? You know, I'm... I was almost old enough to be sent to Vietnam. Fortunately, I wasn't. Thank you, President Nixon. You may have been a crook after all, but you got rid of that draft. <laughs> I had some older friends who were in Vietnam. But what they did back then, at least in the latter years of Vietnam, they had like a lottery system. And if your birthday, they, it's like birthdays, right? People born, let's say the year was, I don't know, they, people starting draft people from born 1952, for example. Then you'd have a whole, all the birthdays, January 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, up to December 31st, and you'd draw it a certain number. And if your number was picked, you were going to be drafted and go to Vietnam. If you were lucky, you came up like number 300. Oh, good, they're not going to pick me this year. <laughs> right? Now, that seems like a very democratic way of doing it, of course. Well, I could suggest we get you and I, my friend, remember, we're the leaders in 100 years, and we're talking about this. Well, you know what we can do? Let's have something like they did in the Vietnam era. We have some kind of a lottery system for young people, for people aged 15 to 45. And this is to sterilize people. If your number comes up, you're going to be sterilized. But it's like a lottery. We're not going to sterilize everybody because that's not necessary. Ah, but of course, then you say, okay, but what happens if, if the people we end up sterilizing, people that maybe if countries like Spain, the average Spanish family only has like 1.5 children anyway. You say, well, we don't have to sterilize them, but what about the people in India? They multiply, they have more children. What about people in Africa, like Nigeria? They might have a whole bunch of kids. Shouldn't we prefer to sterilize them? Ah, but then racism comes into it, right? Ooh, because on the one hand, very logically, there's some populations, especially poor populations, that multiply more quickly. So they should be the ones to be sterilized. And maybe we're forced to sterilize some people just because of the exploding population. But how ethical is it to say, well, okay, we're going to sterilize these poor black people or these poor Indians, but not the more affluent Germans because they only have 1.5 children per family anyway, or Spanish or whatever. Ooh, is that really ethical? And besides that question, is it ethical to force anybody to be sterilized? I think not. So how do we solve this problem ethically? But even for, more fundamentally, for stability of the world and for our very lives, how do we do these things in such a way that the people of the world don't revolt, don't rise up and kill us and kill the whole ruling class because they're seeing that we're killing them off, trying to sterilize them or sterilizing by something, when they're drinking water or whatever. What happens then? Is the world going to go to chaos? Here's a thought for you. Here's a thought for you. What is really humanity? 
And I'm not going to answer that question for you, but I'm going to talk about it in the near future. When you think of humanity, when you think of, for example, fighting global warming slash climate change to save humanity in the future, when you think of medical technology progressing to save humanity, when you think of humanity concretely, what do you think of? I ask you that, and I ask you to ponder that question, because in the near future, maybe in the next few days, I'm going to talk about this question. What is humanity in your mind, in my mind, and what is humanity in, just for example, Bill Gates' mind? What is humanity in George Soros' mind? What is humanity in, I don't know, Donald Trump's mind, Biden's mind, whoever, pick anybody. What is humanity in the mind of the deep state? What is humanity in the mind of Pope Francis? Well, we don't have to go through all these individuals. But what I'm saying is, what is humanity in the mind of the average person, just, you know, people? And what is humanity, what's an, an alternative vision of what humanity really is? See if you can come up with the answer to that. I'll explain it to you in a few days. I won't get into it yet. Once again, we're 100 years of future. So what do we do to start either sterilizing people and kill people off? And remember, we are ethical people. I'm an ethical guy. And I believe you, my listener, are as well. Because most people, I don't care what country you live in, I don't care what race you belong to, I don't care what religion you have, most people, in my experience, are good ethical people. Most people. Not all, by any means. And I don't just mean religious people. But religious people, no matter what your religion, most people, I think, are good people. Most atheists are good people as well. Most agnostics are good people. And you and I, I believe, are good people. But what solution would we have to this? It's kind of like the lifeboat problem, isn't it? Imagine now you and I are two of the crew members on the Titanic that has just sunk, and we managed to save ourselves, and we're in a lifeboat. But they didn't have enough lifeboats for the Titanic, as you maybe know. So, say lifeboat has a capacity of 30 people. But then we accept the people are swimming around, they're drowning. So we take in another person, another person, then it's 35, 40, 45, 50. And the absolute maximum that you can take, for example, I, don't, I forget what the number was, say it's 50 people. But there's still people swimming, swimming around drowning. What do we do? Now I'm taking you, my friend, into the past. Over 100 years ago, now we're two crew members of the Titanic in the lifeboat. So we have command because we're crew members. But the lifeboat is totally filled. If we take on just one, two more people, that boat's going to capsize and everybody dies. So what do we do? What do we do? We say, well, we can't let people swim. Hey, there's a little child. Well, what do you do? Do you take in the child? you throw out the old guy? Well, maybe if he volunteers. Well, that's one solution. You can do that. But what happens if there are more children? What happens if there are more young women or whatever, whoever you might maybe prefer to save, I don't know. What happens if you can't let even so much as a baby on <laughs> without the boat capsize? Then you have to throw somebody off and take in three babies. Okay, you can do calculations and you can try to save as many young people as possible. But sooner or later, you're at the point where when somebody grabs onto the side of the lifeboat because they're half drowning and they're saying, save me, save me, you have to pick up the oars, you have to beat their hands and break their fingers so they let go. And in effect, you're killing that person. Is that ethical? Well, it sure doesn't seem ethical to me, but you have no choice, do you now? Because if you do nothing, everybody's going to die. Now here, in this metaphor, the boat is the earth. And what happens, you know, a friend of mine told me that he read that the earth theoretically can, could support up to 23, 24 billion people if we use all the land in the perfect way with the perfect, I don't know, manure and new technology, we could support that many. But then that would be the absolute limit. What happens if it's then 25 billion or 30 billion? What happens if a lifeboat is overflowing that we have to kill people? First of all, whom do we decide to kill? In the lifeboat, you decide, well, look, that's only a child of five. Sorry, old man. Sorry, David. Well, I'm 65. Sorry, you gotta, you got to take the leap, <laughs> right? <laughs> because we have to save this five-year-old child. And maybe I would volunteer to do that to save the five-year-old child. You don't know how you're going to react in that situation. But in any case, you have to condemn people to death because you and I are, are the crew members in lifeboat. We have the say here. And we have the pistols at our side, for example. So if people rebel against us, hey, we shoot that person who rebels and we take in somebody else. But we have to start 
rejecting people and even killing people if they try to get onto the boat by force. So now we go into the future again, 100 years in the future instead of 100 years in the, in 100 and some years in the past. What do we do if we're the world leaders? We see we have to kill people off. How do we make that selection? And second of all, how do we do it? We can announce on TV, sorry folks, uh, the world population has gotten so out of hand, but we have a plan. We have a really good idea. The idea is that uh, everybody over 65 is going to have to submit to becoming suicided. In other words, you have to be eliminated. I don't think they're going to go along with it. I mean, some would. Some would sacrifice themselves for it. But some are going to say, hey, I'm 72, but I, I'm mentally fit. I don't want to die. And then the grandchildren and, the, and the, his children speak up. Hey, you're not going to kill grandpa. We're not going to let it happen. So what do you do then? You start killing off certain races. By what moral criteria are you going to do that? Well, you can't do that. Now, maybe you think, okay, other races, that's fine. But it's better if only the more intelligent people survive because they can contribute more to progress. Well, now we have eugenics, don't we? Hitlerian uh, genetics. Even before Hitler, excuse me, my friends, the phone is ringing. Got to put this on pause for just a second. Excuse that very brief interruption there. I had to get the phone. Okay, where were we? Eugenics. Yeah, the Hitlerian model, right? There's some people that are simply undesirable. Uh, let's say people uh, they are mentally challenged, for example, or people who are, are physically challenged, uh, or, well, certain races, obviously Jews, and I don't know, he would have gotten to the blacks and, and, and uh, Arabs as well sooner or later, right? Uh, people like Margaret Sanger, who was the founder, one of the founders of Planned Parenthood, and she was very much into eugenics. Uh, but of course, these people who always think that they're part of the superior half of mankind, right? You never hear any of these people saying, yes, mankind has to become improved. We have to breed people better, so I'm going to kill myself. No, they don't say that. The ones who plan it, they're the ones who are superior ideologues, Karl Marx, for example, with communism, right? They're, these are people who want to decide what the world should be like in the future according to their model. Rather despicable, isn't it? But what do you and I do as leaders in the future a hundred years from now? How do we kill people off? It's the big lifeboat. We know we have to do it. This is a problem. Logically, Logically, we know we have to start killing people or sterilizing people and or sterilizing people, I should say. Logically, we can say, well, older people, they've already lived 60, 70, year, 80, whatever. And, you know, they're just a real big burden on the system. So maybe we should kill them off. But then we can say, well, I don't know. Uh, let's add some other group, maybe the people that aren't so intelligent, we can start killing them. Or the people who might protest a little more, they're troublemakers, let's start killing them. Where does it stop? Now, let's look at some concrete numbers for population. I'm getting to something here, something big, something big and something horrible. All the more horrible because, you see the direction I'm going, I'm taking you and me as an example. We're the leaders and we're good people. And yet even we would come to the conclusion that people have to be sterilized and or people have to be killed because the lifeboat is full. So now, as I mentioned, there are almost 8 billion people in the world. Only 221 years ago, the year 1800, there were only about 1 billion people. So it's eight times more people now. 200 years before that, there were only about 500 million people, not even a billion people in the world. In the time of Christ, and well, the time of Augustus, 2,000 years ago, there were about 170 million people in the world. 170 million people, that's like half the population of the U.S. And that was the entire population of the world 2,000 years ago. So, now my friend, we are still leaders 100 years in the future, and we have taken the the horrible decision that we have to start killing people. What's the goal? What number is really the goal? Do we want to reduce the people by what? By a billion? Well, there are eight billion. Well, 
It's 7 billion. Is that really going to help that much because it can get back up to 8 billion in no time? No, it has to be more than that. What's the ideal number of people in the world in our view? Because now we're starting to think like futurist ideologues, right? There are 8 billion people in the world, assuming there are only 8 billion in, in 100 years, and that's not going to be the case. It's going to be optimistically 11 billion. The number doesn't matter so much. Even if it's 8 billion because of mechanization, there'll be so many people that, that won't have work, it'll be problematic, etc. cetera. How do you just be at least 11 billion people, most likely, I think, closer to 20 billion people? So how do we kill them? First of all, what goal do we have? And I'm thinking this through totally logically. Remember, Australians don't hate kangaroos, but they made a logical decision, kangaroos have to be killed. Now, of course, if you and I are more of more spiritually inclined. If we, if we don't judge people by their intelligence or by the color of the skin, but by, by the fact that they are spirits inhabiting bodies, we're going to have a lot of problems with this. We won't be able to sleep at night. Even if we have to kill people, we might end by killing ourselves just because we feel so terrible about it. But not everybody thinks that way. Not everybody feels that way. Hitler had no problem killing millions of people. Stalin killed, according to most historians, more people than Hitler. He didn't care. Mao Zedong. Well, there's a fine man for you. By the way, under Mao, more people were killed than under Hitler and Stalin combined. It's estimated between 30 and 70 million people died under Mao Zedong. And there's a chilling scene described by uh, Mao's doctor. Happened, I think, back in the late 50s, early 60s, whenever. Uh, this doctor was with Mao and got knocked on the door and some general entered, politician, whoever, and wanted to report something important to Mao. Mao said, what is it? And he said, I just got news. In a certain province, 100,000 people have died. Well, they died because of his dumb economic policies, you know, making people work in farms and they weren't cut out for it or whatever. He had all these weird plans that led to the deaths of millions of people. And another 100,000 had died. Mao said, oh, okay. And the guy left the room. And then Mao got right back to the conversation with the doctor as if nothing had happened whatsoever. And the doctor was horrified. He didn't say anything, of course. But he thought, my God, this man just learned that 100,000 of his citizens have perished and he doesn't care whatsoever. And let me tell you, my friend, there are people out there today that are exactly like that. There are people who see people not as individuals. They don't see an individual as something wonderful and rich and experience and and with depth with mental depth with spiritual depth they don't see it like that they see us as extra kangaroos it's not just somebody like mao or somebody like stalin uh, or somebody like pol pot in cambodia who wiped out almost a third of his country fortunately cambodia only had about seven million people he killed about two million he killed almost 30 percent of the people in his country and he didn't care Idi Amin in Uganda, he didn't kill that many, he killed about, in a few years, 250,000 people. He didn't care. And let me tell you, there are a lot of people like that. It's what Stalin himself said, the death of one person is a tragedy. The death of thousands is a statistic. And guess what? He's right, and I'll prove it to you here. If you read the story, maybe the, the, the I don't know, the... the misery of somebody in the Holocaust, of one individual, and you see a movie about one individual, what they went through in the years pre-Hitler, when Hitler was rising in power, when he got the power, uh, you can identify with that person and you will suffer with that person. But if you pick up a newspaper and read, earthquake in China, 1,500 dead, do you cry? I don't. I'll admit I don't. Because if you cry every time you see a large number of people getting killed or even a single person getting killed, you're going to be crying all the time. We can't afford to do that. It's just a statistic. But if you read a book about one of those people that died in that earthquake, say some young woman who had all the hope in the world for fine life, and then there's this big trembling of the earth and she died miserably under the rubble of some house, you would probably cry. Or if you saw it in a movie, for example. Because that's the death of one person that you can identify with. I'm going to talk much more about this subject in future talks. Now we're talking about how can we wipe out a good percentage of the world's population. Because remember, you and I are world leaders in 100 years, and it must be done. The lifeboat is over full, and we have to do something about it. But how do we do that? This is the last part of this rather <laughs> eerie talk that I'm giving you. And I say to you, I don't know what ideas you would have. You could say, well, let's just start a war and have big nuclear war. I say, hey, wait a minute, though. 
but the ones that survive, okay, we can make it look like a big war. We and the deep state in different countries, we can get together. I don't know, China, Russia, and name any countries you want, the United States, and we, we fabricate a nuclear war and kill off many, many people. Meanwhile, we're in our underground bunkers and we're the ones that survive. We put a number of millions of people in underground bunkers all the world and they're the ones that come out then and start the new world. You might say that. And I say, wait a minute though, the whole world's gonna be full of nuclear waste, that's no world. And you say, oh, that's right, I forgot about the nuclear waste. Well, then how should we do it? And I say something like, well, how about my lottery system for sterilizing people? Okay, there are many people, we don't have to start killing them off. The old people just end up dying and uh, sooner or later, maybe the, the average age of death by then will be 100 years old. Okay, we just were patient so long. Uh, but then with the young people, we have lottery system sterilizing. We say, wait a minute. You look at the young people and say, okay, you're 17, 18, 20, whatever, but your number came up, so come to the clinic when I sterilize you. You say, they're not going to put up with that. They're going to get their guns or, or I don't know, get <laughs> scythes and, and pitchforks and come after us. And I say, oh, yeah, you know, you're right there. Oh, that's true. I guess that's not going to work either. And then I say, hmm, you know, suppose we could kill a lot of people without them realizing that we're doing it. And you say, oh, come on now, how are we going to do that? Even if we start wars, we can, we can pretend that some other cause, you know, that it's politics and, you know, Putin and, and the president of America, they're not getting along. We can pretend that, but we don't want the nuclear war on the other hand. And, and people might wise up to that, say, no, 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 let's be more clever about that. Suppose, for example, some pandemic broke out. And you say, oh, well, now you're talking because after all, we're 100 years in the future. And, you know, in China, in Chinese TV, I saw once, they were talking in a show about how it's possible to wipe out only one race using genetics. You know, you, you come up with something and it only kills whites and blacks and Indians, so the whole world could be repopulated by Chinese. That's probably possible even today, but in 100 years, that's certainly possible. But then, you know, I suggest that, being the leader 100 years in the future, remember, we're good guys but we have to kill people off. I say, yes, some kind of pandemic is going to kill a whole lot of people. Uh, maybe not along racial lines, but for example, let's make a pandemic that kills mainly old people because they've had their lives, right? They'd be the first to be pushed out of the lifeboat anyway because they've already lived 70 years. You say, well, that's an idea. How about some kind of pandemic that primarily just kills old people? And you say, hey, wait a minute, let's add something to it. How about if it kills mainly old people and younger people have a lot of other medical conditions. In other words, the people that are a burden to the medical system, right? The guy might only be 30 years old, but he has severe asthma, he has heart problems, he has a club foot, whatever, he has so many medical problems, he's always going to the doctor, and we have in our country maybe a social system. He's costing the system tens of thousands of dollars a year because of these problems. Suppose there's some kind of a, a pandemic we release that only kills people with, for example, at least two serious medical conditions, even if they're younger. And it kills mostly old people too. And I say, ooh, now you're talking. Because there are a lot of old people in the world, we could get rid of them. The people that are burdened to the system because of you know, medical problems, well, that wouldn't be bad either. But still there's a problem because even if we subtract all those people, there's still a lot of other people. And let's face it, my friend, whatever your name is, I don't know who's listening to this, <laughs> we have to kill off, ideally, maybe, five billion people. There are eight billion, or by then, 11 billion people. What am I saying, five billion? There, by then, maybe 11 billion, optimistically speaking, in the world, 11 billion people. Ideal would be to go back to like it was in 1800, just one billion. Or like it was in 16, only 500 million. And then we repopulate the world, the 500 million select people. But that means we have to kill off, what? Maybe 10 billion people. It's not enough to kill off old people and people with sicknesses. We have to kill off healthy people too. Mm, you say, how can we do that? Well, I say, you know, assuming there's still different countries in the world, let's assume there's no one world government. First, we have to make a one world government because we have to do these things. And if we have other governments that might be against this, then we're going to have wars which we don't want. So first we move everything towards a one world government. And you say, well, how should we do that? I'm assuming now that there are different governments in 100 years, right? Well, I say one way to do it, uh, how can we, we have to manipulate the masses so they want one world government, so they don't oppose us. How can we do that? And you say, that, oh, I know, fear. Fear can, when people fear, they don't think straight. 
So we have to get them scared. And then you say, hey, the pandemic idea is good because that's going to terrify people. And you say, even if it's not so serious, and I say, yeah, you know, it better not be so serious. And you say, why? I say, well, look, on the one hand, if we have to kill off 10 billion people in the year 2121, on the other hand, if we release some really, really deadly thing, suppose it gets us or our friends. We don't want that. It has to be controllable because we have to kill off normal people too. And I'm healthy. I don't want it killing me. I don't want killing my wife. I don't want killing people that I don't want killed. You say, well, what are we going to do this? Well, okay, a pandemic that's not so bad, but we make it sound bad. We conspire, maybe with different governments too, because they realize that we have this problem. And then we can move everybody towards a one world government and say, hey, the countries have to team together. We need more world organizations. We need a world government because we have to face this great panic. And you say, wait a minute, though, but if the disease we release isn't really so deadly, I say, no problem with that at all. There's no problem. It doesn't have to be so deadly. You can say, well, we could lie to people and say it's going to kill off 2.5% of the population or at least 1% like the Spanish influenza 100 years, uh, 200 years ago because we're talking now from the future, right? Uh, but then people are going to wise up. I say, well, you know what? People could wise up, but suppose we censor those people. What you say? I say, hey, suppose, suppose the people in the media that we control anyway in great part, suppose they just tow our line and they put out the propaganda line. Suppose they say openly that, oh, this is deadly. This is going to kill certain people. You should be afraid. You should do this. You should do that. And, and you say, you think that's going to work? I say, yes, yeah, sure, it's going to work. Propaganda works. Our propaganda machine has been honed so greatly. Going back, really, centuries, but especially if you look back at communism, you know, the communists, they, they developed propaganda to a science. And not only the communists, look at, look at Madison Avenue, advertising, propaganda has become a science, and then look at the CIA. If you don't know what MK Ultra is, look it up. A mind control program by the CIA started well back in the 50s, 40s, 50s, I believe. Look at the propaganda of World War II on both sides. And 100 years from now, oh, our people, our intelligence service is going to be absolute masters of propaganda. So we know how to sway the narrative. So what we do is we release some kind of pandemic that might not even be so bad. Maybe it doesn't even exist or maybe it does. Okay. But then we inflate the numbers. We get people in fear mode. And you, and you say, well, how's that going to kill people off? Because you say it's not so serious. You say, hi, no, wait a minute. There's vaccines. What? But vaccines are going to cure people. Huh. Yeah, if they do cure people. Suppose we come up with a vaccine that's not going to cure people. Suppose we come up with a vaccine that's going to weaken people's immune system. And in six months or a year, these people that have the vaccine, most of them, okay, some have terrible reactions and drop dead, but that's a really small number. Most of them are going to seem fine afterwards, but there's something in their system that in a year they're weakened. And then when another wave of the same sickness comes along, it normally won't kill them. Then it's going to kill them. And then we can say it's a new variant. And then we say we need another vaccine. You need another vaccine. We give them something else. And you say, oh, David, now I get it. Because meanwhile, you and I aren't taking these vaccines. I say, exactly. The people that we don't want to die, we're not taking those vaccines. Oh, sure. We as world leaders, we might appear on TV. Look, folks, this beautiful nurse next to me. What's your name, honey? Sally. Okay, Sally here is going to inject me with my super duper vaccine. One of many that I'm going to need in the future. But hey, with such a nice nurse next to me, who minds the vaccine? I can take the little jab and you take the jab. And you say, well, wait, I thought you didn't want the vaccine. Oh, no, of course not. There's only vitamin C in my vaccine. But who knows that because they put it on TV and people are going to believe it. Of course they are. You have a nice smile, have a nice smile. I can lie as well as you. How do you think we became world leaders anyway? I think you know where this is going. You might say, oh, this is some anti-vaxxer. I'm not anti-vaxxer. I had a smallpox vaccine, I had a polio vaccine, all these things as a kid. I'm not against vaccines. And I'm not going to go more into this topic. I want you to think for yourself and to look for maybe some alternative news on this. What I'm saying here is, and this is what I want you to ponder, this is my main message for now. This is my main message for now. What I want you to think about is, if you and I were leaders of the future, being good people, but seeing that the lifeboat is overflowing and knowing 
that we have to sterilize and or murder, I'll say it directly, we have to murder most of the world's population because it simply can't go on like that. What methods would we choose to do that? How would we do it? There's another method we could use I'll talk about in another talk. If you think what I just said was chilling, because remember, I'm not speaking as somebody who is Hitlerian or a Stalinist or a Mao Zedong. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm pretty ethical. I consider myself a good person. But the truth is, if I win that lifeboat as one of the crew members with a pistol, I, thought I would be forced to start killing people, pushing them out of the boat that is not letting them enter. Maybe I'd never sleep well again for the rest of my life, but I'd have to do it because if not, the whole boat sinks. And sooner or later, the world's going to be in that position. Now, I just ask you one more question. Could it possibly be? Possibly. I'm not saying 100% this case. I never say 100%. Anybody who says I'm 100% sure hasn't thought it through or is a fool or both. Because to say 100%, that's really strong. I say the most 99.999%, okay, but 100%, you can never be 100% sure. Socrates was never 100% sure. That's why his philosophy was always questioned. But I ask you this, considering the great, the great rise in population, considering the fact that, that when we had the three greatest destructive events probably in world history, World War I, the Spanish flu, so-called Spanish flu, and World War II, that in those 32 years, the world population went up and not down. Considering the fact that since 1951, the world's population has tripled. Considering the fact that even optimists among the experts say that it's going to level up maybe 11 or 12 billion, but that that would be like maybe two or three times population of China. Considering the fact that more and more people are going to be useless because of mechanization. Considering the fact that the world's resources are limited and the more people there are, the more they use them up. And considering the fact that with democracy, you can't just go out and willfully kill people because they'll rise up. Could it possibly be, let me ask you, could it possibly be that even in our times, re returning now to our times, 2021, in the past years, could it be that even a number of years ago, certain people in power and certain people with extreme financial power, political power, that they recognized this problem in the future and they thought, hmm, what can we do about this? And they came up with exactly the same conclusions that you and I, Mike, you and I being ethical people, would come up with in 100 years. Namely, let's kill off people. Let's do it through a so-called pandemic. Nothing really deadly because then we could get killed. But let's force the people one way or another to get these vaccines. Once again, going to the future, you might say, no, but David, suppose doctors come up with, with medicines that could cure the sickness and people would need vaccines. Mm -hmm. Does that remind you of anything? Like these more and more doctors that have said how hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, sometimes in combination, this was another drug that Trump used and he was better in a week. What do we do there? But I would say to you, oh, it's easy. We just suppress those people's voices. We throw them off the future version of Facebook and YouTube. We don't let them talk. If they talk, we ban them. We censor them. And our news services in 100 years, that is CNN of the future, we never talk about that. And if somebody says that, we say that they're trying to kill people. These people, they're fanatics. How could they dare say such a thing? You need your vaccine. You need your vaccine. That's what we would do. And guess what I would say to you? Most of the people are such sheep, they would, they would go along with us. Because, and then I would say to you, way back in the last, over a century ago, back in the 60s, psychologists doing tests came up with the conclusion that about two-thirds of people follow authority. This explains a lot. This explains why how Hitler could get into power. Because two-thirds of people think, oh, things couldn't be all that bad. You know, Hitler can't be all that bad. And guess what? He was. A story I might have already told in my talk on conspiracy theories. Uh, and I think I did, but I'm going to tell you this again in case you didn't hear the other one. During World War II, when the Holocaust was in full swing and they were murdering all together, it just in Auschwitz, they killed about four million people. Four million human beings whose lives were ended there. There was one man who escaped. I think he was Polish. And he escaped. He thought, I have to tell the world. The world's leader have to know because people didn't know. The Germans didn't know what their own government was doing there. When, uh, uh, Auschwitz was in, in modern-day Poland. But the Nazis were running, of course. They didn't know what was going on, the average German citizen. And the Americans sort of didn't know what was going on. And this man who escaped from there thought, I have to get word. So he, through different channels, he had to meet some people, then they had to talk to other people. Finally, word got to the, 
It got to Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself. And Roosevelt and his cabinet, they were talking about it. And guess what they concluded? Their conclusion was, well, we know Hitler's bad. He attacked other countries, but he wouldn't be killing people in gas chambers. He wouldn't do that. They didn't believe it. But guess what? It was happening. So once again, I ask you, I think I've led you down the path of maybe a bit more uh, being awake in the future. Even you and I would have to think sooner or later about sterilizing and or killing people a hundred years in the future. But what if certain powerful people and forces, organizations, have already seen that danger now, maybe they saw it 10, 20, 30 years ago, and they've come up with a plan to do exactly what you and I might do in a hundred years. What if? Would that explain what we're seeing today? You think about that. And one more thing I want you to think about until the next time, maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll talk about this in the next uh, podcast. What is humanity for you? Think about this. Because I'm going to tell you the next time what humanity is for me and probably what it is for you and what it is for certain people, for certain ideologues that want to shape our future. I'll tell you what humanity is for them and it might terrify you. It might shock you. It might not surprise you. If you're a totally logical thinker and reasonable thinker, it won't shock you, but it will sadden you greatly. And on that note, after that... <laughs> very unpleasant subject of overpopulation, a problem that's not going away, let me tell you, it's not going away unless dire measures are taken. One further thing to think about, how could we control overpopulation using purely ethical means? Because everything I told you here, what we, you and I would do in the future, you and I being ethical people, what we would do is something very logical, but it sure isn't very ethical. Here we meet a collision. The collision is between two of the branches of classical philosophy, those being metaphysics and ethics and politics. Believe it or not, politics is one of the branches of classical philosophy. And logic, of course, that I named them all here, and, and aesthetics. But here we have logic and ethics. What we would have to face a hundred years future, you and I being leaders of the world, is a total collision between logic and ethics. It would be totally logical that people have to be killed and, and or sterilized. On the other hand, it's totally unethical, no matter how we do it. Whether we do it through wars, whether we do it through, through, through pandemics, through vaccines, it'd be totally unethical. But it's just like in the lifeboat once again. Is it ethical? to smash somebody's hands with an oar because you can't live in the boat? That doesn't sound very ethical to me, but it's totally logical because if you don't do it, the whole boat capsizes. So how do we resolve this problem? How do we solve the problem? I don't know. I have some ideas that I will share with you in the future, but this is a really big problem. And think about this seriously. Probably nobody's really giving this much thought, maybe some experts, but then the danger is that some of these experts having certain connections come up with a really great solution. And maybe what is happening today down the path of vaccines. You think about this. Because this is a totally logical path. Assuming that that's what's being done today. I'm not saying it's 100%. But let me tell you, it sure looks like it to me. And let me tell you, it's a brilliant plan that they have. Because you and I, being ethical people in 100 years, would probably decide on doing the same thing. So this is dead serious, let me tell you. You think about all this. Until the next time, you think about what your definition of humanity would be. What is humanity for you? And after this most unpleasant, rather long and most unpleasant podcast, I hope at least that it opened your mind in some directions and made you think of certain possibilities, made you see perhaps more clearly what possibly is being done today and why, should we be, why we should be extremely alarmed at what's going on today. But at the same time, at the same time understanding that what is possibly going on today is something that you and I might do in the future. And this is something that should create in you a sort of ethical conflict. But we have to work our way through it because, my friend, you and I are in the path of Socrates. And on that path, we never cease questioning. 
we always question. We never think we have the truth. We're always heading towards the truth, getting deeper and deeper in something, and we don't shy away from any problem, from any dilemma, from any train of thought that might lead us down an unpleasant path. No, we are brave. We face any question, and we continue to question and continue to look at, at, at everything with the light of reason and always looking for good and ethical solutions to any problems that might come up. That is my path, and I sincerely hope that it's yours. Till the next time, despite the dire warnings given in this MP3, sorry if I ruined your day, despite all this, uh, I wish you a fine day wherever you may be. Bye now.